So without further ado, I think we'll uh, introduce our panel. I'll ask the speakers to take the stage. And somebody you have not yet seen is the panel moderator, William Newton, who was a previous speaker during the year. William Newton, quite a character himself, is... <laughs> I don't know about that. ...is an art critic at The Federalist. He is a graduate of the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, the University of Notre Dame Law School, and Sotheby's Institute of Art in London. He lives in Washington, D.C., and William's musings can be found on his well-acclaimed blog of The Courtier. And so he will introduce some first questions ruthlessly to the speakers. <laughs> and, um, and then after that, we will take questions from all of you. Indeed. And so, thank you. What did you mean at the end of your lecture, when you were a bit rushed for time, that we are supposed to make of reclaiming classical art and architecture from the unfortunate context that it was given? Again, bearing in mind that, that you didn't get to fully yeah, I, elaborate I, on your conclusion. And so I think this would be a good opportunity for you to do that now. Well, the thing is, we were left in the middle of the, the last century with a problem. The problem was that modernism, modernism had in the 1920, late 1920s and the 1930s begun to die. There was a recovered neo-neoclassicism happening. Dadaism was old hat, expressionism was, was you know, passe. And so there was a great movement for building classical buildings again. Charles N. McIntosh had become old hat. It was James Miller in Glasgow who was the new architect. And he was building great big classical buildings in a, well, rather austere, uh, rather a sleek style. Mm. And of course, Washington was doing it as well. The whole of Scandinavia, Edinburgh, and Berlin. It was the new modern style that you did. Mm. So official modernism, which is now the thing, had gone away, and now a new revived Hellenism had occurred. And it was in deeply embraced by the dictator of, the third, you know, of, of Germany. All the artists of Europe were very jealous, particularly the French, to have a Führer that was so nuts about architecture. I mean, most folk don't give a damn about architecture, I mean, especially politics. But then, of course, the surviving old modernists, they were delighted when everything went wrong and Hitler was discovered to be the monster that he was, because suddenly that art and architecture to which he was affiliated became toxicized. And so what happened then was that there was a revival, a false revival in the negative of the thing that had already burnt itself out. Mm. So we're really dealing with the aftermath, the, the, this, the bastard children of a thing that was already finished, an mm. experiment, and it goes on and on in a groundhog day of repetition. Mm. Right. So we got, we started it in Marcel Duchamp's toilet, you know that? No. And we continued it through Tracy Evans' unmade bed. Right. This is a horrible excursion. Yeah. Uh, it, it, we shouldn't be there. Mm. <laughs> and it's all allowed because we know that that certain person would have hated it. This is what we call Nazi art, the art that couldn't have existed without the presence of that demon. My point is this, evil always hides behind the form of the good. Simple badness shows itself in its brute form, but evil takes up the form of the good and hides behind it. And this is what happened in the Third Reich. They should really strictly have built in their own image shoddy, cruel, jagged, just like they're building London these days, you know? <laughs> well, they got a thing sticking out at the east end of London called the shard. A shard is a thing you go to accident and emergency for, to be removed from your eye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finished talking, right, because right, I've said right, it. Right, 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 that's good, that's good. Um, 
No, Juliet, keep the keep the mic. I wanted I wanted to ask you your 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 presentation was was really original, and and I think one of the reasons I can't speak for the audience obviously, but I, I think for me one of the reasons that I actually felt very touched by it was because you were sharing your personal experience as an artist, obviously, but you were also asking your audience to put themselves in your shoes. Because you kept asking us, hasn't this ever happened to you? Haven't you ever felt this way? Is that empathy, if you will, or, or trying to empathize with somebody else, is that something that informs the way that you do your art? Is that something that, that you sort of keep in mind when you're trying to, to create beauty on canvas or instruct someone else on how to create something beautiful? Uh, n not necessarily. I feel like the desire to learn to see is something that uh, I, I feel like drawing and painting will become obsolete unless we realize that there's something particular that painting and drawing and poetry and literature and architecture have to offer. And that is a unique opportunity for our own self-expression, not just for the painters. The painters make a career of creating those fading moments, those moments that as you're watching them, they're gone, and their desire is to make it last forever. So perhaps it's a little bit of a personality glitch where you feel the loss very keenly, but it's something that uh, becomes relevant to all of us when we see that the same impulse is there. Mm. Very good. Um, Peter, one of the, the takeaways that I had from your presentation, and I don't I don't know if you realize that you use this word quite a bit, but when I was taking notes, I noticed that about a half a dozen times you mentioned the subject of pride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this is something that is obviously a problem in a lot of contemporary art, because it seems to be a lot of it has to do with, look at me, mm -hmm. but to no other end, right? Yes. And I was, I was taken by the, the uh, sort of theory that, that, that you put forward, which is that um, this idea that we're supposed to think that somehow we're so different um, mm -hmm. from every other generation of human beings that has come before us, that we're this uniquely exceptional group of people, and that because of that, because of that sort of almost, if you will, same mentality that went into building the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. that we can simply ignore all of the, the warnings and the examples of the past. That's a, that's a, but, but is that something that, that now obviously you approach this from primarily from, from, from your experience in music, and, and you mentioned how you're building upon the past, you're, you're certainly very much aware of it. Um, and we're always told to ignore the past at our peril. But how do, how do we persuade people that they're not actually losing themselves by paying homage, if you will, to other great people that came before them in the arts? It's a difficult question that you're asking because it has to do with the mystery of conversion. Um, mm. I, I find in my own life that before I could appreciate any of the fine arts, um, including music, I first had to be converted to the beauty of those things. And, and I, I say that that's a mystery because it, it wasn't simply a rational, deductive process. It wasn't like I sat down one day and said, well, I guess I need to appreciate the beautiful. And, and, and I somehow came up with an argument for that. Um, I, I, I'm reminded of, of many stories I've heard about people who've seemingly by chance they've wandered into a church um, while a mass is going on at a place like the Brompton Oratory in London, which is famous for the same kind of liturgies that you see at St. John Cantius. Um, and they, they, they stumble in and they're overwhelmed by the beauty of what they see. They weren't looking for it, in a sense, God came looking for them, mm -hmm. which is the way that it always works. At least, ultimately, it's God looking for us. Um, so in a way, the question boils down to how can you expose people to the kinds of experiences that are likely to enkindle in them the desire to be an apprentice to a great tradition rather than to, to um, well, either to be indifferent or to be lazy or to think that they should be original in that kind of superficial way that people talk about originality. Um, one thing that, that I remember really struck me is when I was taking a course on the Gospel of John um, and the teacher pointed out that what Jesus says about the devil is that the devil speaks from himself. Right? 
Um, and it's almost like a definition that, that Jesus gives. He's the one who speaks out of himself. And the one who speaks out of himself is a liar. Um, and and that, that got me thinking about the fact that human beings, we don't exist by ourselves. No man is an island, as John mm -hmm. Donne said. Mm -hmm. We actually exist in society. We, can't, we come into existence through a family. And we, we seek friendship. That's, in many ways, the highest natural good we have. So we exist outside of ourselves. Our, our very mode of human existence is to exist in and with others. Um, and that is, for me, tradition and, and how tradition relates to culture and the arts has to do with just awakening to that communal dimension. And not to go into any of this, but I think that, unfortunately, modern life, um, especially with, with a lot of modern technology, is very isolating. And people are very absorbed in their smartphones or, or in their internet gaming or whatever, or Facebook, or all these things that are good tools. But well, some of them are good tools. Uh, maybe not all of them. But it seems like modern life is making people more and more isolated and atomized. And that's, um, that's obviously a recipe for disaster, because it's, it's, you, you forget um, how much you depend on others and, and then on mm -hmm. the past and on tradition. And certainly from a, from, from a learning aspect, as, as what you were saying before, the idea of apprenticeship, and the, yes. and because you, you, can't, you can't learn in a vacuum. I mean, you, well, you can, but you're not going to be any good at what you do, necessarily. You know, you're sort of a fluke if you are. But exactly. this, this feeds into something that I wanted to ask you, which is that mm. I was really struck by, and this is not something that is said very often, I was very struck by the humility of an architect who points out that you are conducting a symphony of mm. artists and craftspeople. That you know, you're designing the building, but then there are things that have to go into and, and form part of the building, sculpture, yeah. painting, you know, furniture, that kind of thing, um, when you're doing a church or whatever it is. At the same time, you're sensitive to the fact that while, you know, look, it can only be this big. Right? You know, I, I can't make the tympanum any larger. I'm sorry. You have to work within the dimensions that right. I give you. Um, how much of what you have to work, we all know architects are inevitably going to be constrained by their budgets, but how much of what actually goes into a finished structure that you're working on that has artistic elements to it, um, are you going to be able to tell the sculptor, the painter, whoever it is, that you can go this far and not further? Well, it depends on a number of factors. It's not always entirely up to me. Um, I think that uh, it's very important, the leadership of the priest, mm -hmm. because, um, and I'm, I think Dennis McNamara might uh, have some comments about this, too, if he were asked. But I know that Dennis has trained a lot of priests in um, understanding what is good and what is bad and what, what, what's going to work and what won't. And uh, I think that the priests who have an appreciation and understanding of art are very supportive of the architect. And that makes a very a big difference. The less understanding the priest has, the more they tend to be subject to pressures from within the parish. Uh, and that could just be, you know, a donor, or uh, there are so many pressures uh, that can come to bear on the process. So, uh, you know, there there is this idea that, uh, and I think part of the reason why I wrote the talk the way I did was to kind of dispel this idea, get rid of it, that the architect is this lone genius, mm. you know, striving against all odds to, you know, come up with a great idea. I the, mean, sort of, the sort of uh, Rourke idea. From, yeah, the, from the, the Howard Penn Rourke, and, yeah. and Frank Lloyd Wright famously indeed, went indeed. that way. Yes, yes. And yeah, I, mean, I guess it happens, but in our society, it's less and less a realistic way to approach uh, the process of design. I think people are much more aware. I mean, one of the great things about this kind of organization is that all the people who are here are becoming aware by being here of what is good and what is, you know, what are the problems, what are the issues. So if any of you now go and serve on a building committee, it's going to be tough on the architect because you're going to have a much better idea. So the architect has to not only be sensitive, but also uh, be more inventive, more creative, and come up with better ideas. So, you know, I, it challenges me. It challenges me to 
come up with a better answer when someone asks the question. Mm -hmm. um, I, want, I want to ask the panel in general a question because you've all trained under someone yeah. at some point <laughs> yes. in your career. Um, did the person that you trained under influence positively or negatively what you now see as the beautiful? Mm. Hmm. Oh, tough question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the word training. When you go to art school in the 1970s, 1976, <laughs> as I did, there's no training available at all. Mm. It's just supervised play. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. You do, you do learn how to smoke and drink too much. <laughs> and this has lasted me all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I trained under the eyes of dead artists. You know, I really learned that way. Yes. And mm -hmm. they true. always hover around my shoulders. And I think, what will Canova think of this? <laughs> and what will Charles Sargent Jagger think of this? Mm. And other painters and poets as well, mm. all looking at the question of the taste. What gesture are made here? Is it kitschy? Is it wrong? Is it overwhelming? And mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't have a chance to chuck our masters, those of us who are self-taught. That's the problem. Uh, they were all dead. I mean, mm. if they'd been alive, we'd have chucked them, for sure. <laughs> but they weren't. And so they've they stayed with us. Mm. Mm. Um, Juliet, did you, did, did you have to sort of hold your nose when you were studying with, with a, a, a more senior painter? Or, or were, um, they, were you in sync? Well, I, th I studied for a decade. And when I started studying, uh, the internet didn't exist for people who were working in the tradition. The tradition was fragmented beyond recognition, and so you had different pieces with um, different places with tiny bits of it. So it was almost like a treasure hunt, and it was very exciting, but you only ever got a piece of it. And so uh, the first number of books I did was almost more for myself than anyone else. Say, okay, we're going to put this here, and then we've got a couple gaps. And so rebuilding. And I was very fortunate to be able to find people to study with. The idea of master copy in, which is the idea of training and learning a tradition in painting, uh, has suffered in a way more than in music and in, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because if a note is played wrong, it's unendurable, <laughs> really. <laughs> but uh, in painting, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And so when you choose to train under someone, it's almost a process of emulation. And so if you think of your families, how often, how often do you learn to cook by going to culinary school? And how often is from just being around a family that knows how to put something on the table? And so when you're studying at these schools, or in, and I was fortunate to do under uh, various masters, a lot of it you pick up from watching. And then you say, OK, but there's still a gap. And then that's how it mm. happened for me. Mm. Yeah. That's fascinating. You know, I, I was thinking about, I had never really thought about the point that if you're a painter, you can feel very isolated and you're just doing it on your own. But if you're going to sing choir music, you have to have a choir. Mm -hmm. And you have to give them something that they can sing. And, um, and, and actually, if, if you don't have professional singers, but amateur singers, you have to give them something relatively easy to sing. So there are, there are limits built into the very nature of music that make it, I think, a little more conservative. I mean, the, the worst music I've ever heard is what's played by professional ensembles or perform because they have the talent and the money to do awful things. <laughs> but but if, if you have, you know, if you've got like your parish choir, they don't want to sing atonal, you know, I mean, you can't do that. Um, but I, I had two blessings in this regard. One, one blessing was my high school music teacher, whom I have a really deep uh, reverence for. I went to an all boys Catholic school and he ran the choir. Um, he ran it very strictly. He had a great sense of humor, but also a great sense of discipline. Um, and he's the one who really inspired me with a love for music, first and foremost. And then I ended up taking music lessons with him um, and, and composition lessons. And he, what I loved about him in retrospect, I didn't notice it at the time, 
is how he always seemed genuinely interested in my own musical ideas, even though they were really primitive. I mean, looking back now, I'm thinking, how could he have been so patient? Mm. Um, and, and how could he have, I mean, was he pretending to be interested? Or, but he was really genuinely there um, as a teacher, showing me how to harmonize music. And so I went through that whole discipline with him. Um, and the other blessing I had was just, I went to Thomas Aquinas College, and the choir director lived two hours away. And when he found out that I could, that I sort of knew how to conduct, he said, oh, great. Can you start running choir practices for me? Because I really don't want to drive this far every week. So as a mm -hmm. freshman in college, I was thrown into a situation where I actually had to run to help him run choir practices, which I never expected. Um, and so it was just learning on the job wow. in, in that sense. Of, um, again, I don't know if I would have assigned that task to myself, but it was assigned to me. That's, that's, that's great. Um, um, and Ethan, obviously, in order to be a, a licensed architect, you have to study under a lot of people. So did you have to sort of overcome a more senior architect trying to convince you that, that Le Corbusier was just one of the most, created some of the most beautiful buildings in the world and that you just had to sort of accept? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, clearly. <laughs> uh, I think that, um, I, well, I went uh, my junior summer in high school Father Moriarty took a group of us to Italy, and uh, that was my first real introduction um, to architecture of churches, certainly, that I really felt I could emulate. Um, certainly, Rome was, was, was an eye-opener for me. Um, but I, I hadn't decided to study architecture at that point, but I, I kind of fell in love with it. Um, when I went to study architecture, it was a an enormous shock. Um, I felt like I had to go through 10 years of agony in order to get to the other side so I could actually do something that I would enjoy doing. And mm. um, now, that's not to say that the education was, I, I wouldn't go as far as what Sandy's saying. I mean, the education was good. I, I think I, I learned a lot, and I, I'm grateful for what I learned. But I didn't learn anything about Gothic architecture, church architecture, um, anything about religious architecture. I mean, it's really, it was, it, during my time, it was a verboten subject. Mm. So I had to really learn that on my own wow. afterward. Wow. Well, um, those are enough questions from me. And so <laughs> what we are going to yeah. do now, who has the baton, is it where? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you would like to line up, um, and this lovely lady, are you going to take the mic, Father, or is you're going to take? And if you would like to line up, if you have questions for any all of, all members of the panel or any members of the panel, um, please come up, and uh, Father will hand you the mic. Thank you. Hi, Douglas Dewey from uh, Weathersfield Institute in New York. Uh, thank you all. This was one of the finest conferences that I've attended in many years, and I go to far too many. It was really outstanding, uh, 10 pages of notes, and we'll have the videos, uh, so I think I'll, I'll link them on my website as well. My question, Ethan, is for you. What, is the, what are the three best things to say to somebody, uh, to a, a committee or a group of people building either a chapel? I was recently involved in a campaign to build a new chapel at Christendom College in Virginia, and I wanted to build it out of real stone. Yeah. And I was told that it would be not twice as much, but 25 times as much money uh, to build the thing in stone. So it has stone exterior, you know, stuck on pieces. It'll look beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's Gothic. But when you're building a home, when you're building any kind of a structure, what are the arguments that you found to be effective in convincing people that they should build not for 30 years, but for two or 300 years? and how that's cost effective. What do you tell them? Mm. Well, that's, <laughs> that's very difficult because um, I think all of us, when we approach a building project, whether it's as a committee member or uh, residential, uh, have an idea of what we can really spend. You know, we, we know, we have a general idea of what our budget is. And uh, long-term uh, materials, long life cycle materials definitely cost more. There's no question about it. Um, what I do tell people when they're building a church, though, is that um, 
Well, first of all, you have to approach that as you're bringing the best gifts you can to, the, to God. Mm -hmm. And that it's not building a house. Mm -hmm. It's not building a casino or a car dealership, whatever, right. you know. It's not right. building anything else. It's something that's completely separate and that uh, you have to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, I think, uh, if you build a church with the idea that it's going to be a typical building, a, you know, a 30-year building or a 40-year, our, our, our depreciation schedule for most um, buildings is 39 years. Mm. Uh, in America, we build 39-year buildings. Wow. wow. So, uh, if you, and that includes almost every type of building. So, uh, we don't, uh, the big difference with churches is that you don't have a depreciation schedule. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's not a commercial building. Yeah. So, you really have to think about that pretty hard and think about, um, you know, do I want this building to survive a storm? Do I want this building to be here for generations? We've all been actually beneficiaries of buildings that have been here for generations. They were built by our ancestors really well. Mm, right. And our generation, uniquely, is building junk. Mm, yeah. So, you know, we, I think we, we have to separate that and say, look, you know, most buildings are not going to last a long time. They're not going to be here right. much longer than we are. Yeah. The church is different. You know, there's the, the famous quote from, from Gaudi, from the, the mm -hmm. architect of the Sagrada Familia, when they were complaining that it was taking him such a long time to right. finish, and he said, my client is not in a hurry. That's right, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I like to say my client, uh, you know, I, I have a very unique experience. When I need work, my client gives me work. That's right. Um, <laughs> So Kathleen was asking about the building of St. John Cantius, uh, which is really unique because it was a testament to the Polish immigrants' tremendous faith. Many of the homes that they built, we don't have, but on the pediment of the church, they wrote the words, Ad Maiorum Dei Gloriam, for the greater glory of God. Mm -hmm. And so they really sacrificed everything. They were the pool, uh, poorest clash of, of Polish immigrants, and yet they built this building, which is celebrating 125 years. And um, so it's really amazing to see, even when you see plaster with horsehair intermixed, they couldn't afford real marble, so there was full marbleization. But the actual structure, they really made to last. And that's, I think that also adds to the, the dimension of what you feel as the church being alive because of the sacrifice of so many of these Polish immigrants. So. Yeah. Right. I think it also speaks to what uh, Dr. Peters said about the humility, because there is a humility in inheriting and maintaining uh, the building that, you, that what we are taking on. And so, so many churches in Chicago, you're not keeping ashes, but you're keeping a flame alive, mm -hmm. and that's something that is life-giving. And how, who could have thought these Polish immigrants would never have imagined that their church became home to Chicago's first men's religious community, that their church became home to this movement that you see before you today. Mm. And so it's a great testament to their sacrifices. Mm. Thank you. Our next questioner is actually one of last year's speakers, uh, Dr. Dennis uh, McNamara, sometimes known as DMAC by his students. Um, he was known for shooting down Roger Scruton last year. <laughs> he teaches future priests, and uh, he's the director of the, of the Liturgical Institute. Thank you, Father. My question is for Mr. Stoddard. I wanted to know what you might comment about Arno Brecker, the great sculptor who also worked with the Nazi regime and did his classically inspired sculptures. Thank you, Dennis. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. I'm very concerned about this. <laughs> this is, Dennis is asking about Arno Breker, the sculptor that worked most famously for Hitler. And I actually corresponded with Breker. 
I discovered where he was living, in Dusseldorf. And he was hiding out there, uh, fantastically wealthy, of course. It's due to Switzerland. It's rather marvelous, you know, Switzerland. You can put all your ill-gained money in there. And he was absolutely thrilled to be dug out by a young Scottish sculptor. And I actually wrote to him. It was before the days of internet or any of that. And uh, said I was interested to know his story. Well, it was interesting because he put me in touch with an American foundation that was advocating him. And they had some terrible publications. And I discovered, really, how poor the work of Arno Breaker was, but how strange the story was. Breaker had been a friend of Salvador Dali, uh, Picasso. He'd been part of the Parisian set, Jean Cocteau, all these dudes that were kicking about being avant-gardistes. And uh, for this reason, Breaker had always been regarded as beyond the pale by the Third Reich's, you know, he was always under surveillance because he was known to have trucked with entartete Kunst, mm. degenerate art, right. artists. Mm. So it was a very sticky experience for him, the highest paid sculptor. Josef Torak was the other one. He was older. Uh, Breaker's position was very, very tetchy, very questionable during the Third Reich. Now, after the, the end of the war, he was tried at Nuremberg and forbidden to work for 12 years. So he went scuttling up into the Hartz Mountains, where he opened a private studio, where he proceeded to make Henry Moore lookalikes in a massive effort of backpedaling. And then Stalin got in touch with him and said, what work with me? He said, could have been there, done that. <laughs> so he gave it the bypass and ended up in Dusseldorf, wealthy, unannounced by the, you know, un unrecognized by the contemporary scene. And then I wrote to him and asked him about his work. He came out of Rodin. Hmm. There are other sculptors that worked during the Third Reich who came out of a man called Adolf von Hildebrandt who died in 1921, very accomplished sculptor that knew how to work for architecture. He was a great fountain sculptor. And with a name like Adolf von Hildebrandt, you know, you're not going to get anywhere if your pupils you know, follow you. But Brecker was different. He was trained in, or he went to study in Paris and picked up the Rodin-esque, Rodin, you know, Auguste Rodin. Mm -hmm. And for this reason, his work has a particular kitschiness that we find from Rodin. Mm. And Rodin is a tremendous kitschmonger. Yeah. Where? Oh, yeah, you've got it. <laughs> Avert your eyes, head. Yeah. Really, it's, it's awful stuff, all that surging in the erectile tissue. It's, it's just, it's beyond the pale. <laughs> and this is, this is what gives Breaker his frighteningly attractive quality. Whereas, uh, you know, Adolf von Hildebrandt was a, a seriously cultivated artist. So anyway, Breaker wrote me a letter saying, thanks very much, nobody pays attention to me anymore. I'm nearly dead. <laughs> and then he did die. So I gave the letter he wrote to me to the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds in England, where, from whence it disappeared entirely. Oh, so we'll go on the trailer one day. Well, you want to hear me talk dirty about Rodin? Not right now, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've only had the top of the surface. Well, we can do that later. <laughs> and then Michelangelo's next. What? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> My question uh, is based off of what uh, you, uh, Mr. Stoddard, has said in your, uh, your speech, this, uh, your lecture this evening, but is, of course, open to the entire panel to comment or answer on. Uh, you laid out in your, in your talk how people like Nietzsche lay down and prophesize the coming of the modern world. And he says, God is dead, not as a proclamation, but as a warning of what would come and what monsters would come fill the void once God has left the uh, center of Western civilization and how much, uh, how many horrors we've seen in the 20th century because of that uh, decision to remove God from our lives. And also how much uh, you've referenced people like Nietzsche and uh, Schopenhauer and Sartre as talking about 
the ramifications and the new guidelines laid out in this new modern world because of that essential decision. Uh, and also um, the way that uh, uh, art has progressed in these, in these years between that. Uh, and also mentioned previously how people like uh, Salvador Dali and the Dadists were really reactionary against war, against the horrors of the 20th century that they were seeing unfold before them, and then became lauded as uh, progressives and modernists uh, in the coming generations. Uh, to get to the point, do you see, uh, do, does the panel see traditional architecture and art and aesthetics as the new avant-garde in art? Mm. <laughs> Yes, Jude. Is it going to be me? Yeah, yeah, it's you. The avant-garde is such a ghastly expression. Mm. And who would ever want to be part of it? Mm. Um, we are radicals because we appertain to the root. That's what radical means. It comes from mm. the Latin word radice, meaning the root, as in radish. It's going to root you. So. <laughs> We're radical artists because we go not for the flower, but for the root. And the flower can be manifested in various divergent ways. But the root's always only one thing, and it's buried. And it needn't be dug up, because mm. then it would die. So we are radicals in that respect. I don't think we're revolutionaries, because we're not born of that um, perpetual revolution idea that's central to Trotskyism, for instance, the general dialectic. You know, the Hegelian triad, you know that thing? Mm. You know, a thesis is risen to be opposed by an antithesis. The two fight, and out of the fight, the ruins of the fight, they make a synthesis, which rises to be the new thesis, to be opposed by a new antithesis. <laughs> There's a secondary fight, <laughs> and another centaur arises out of this to become the new thesis. So this is... This is basically what the forward-moving um, um, culture of the mm -hmm. modernist age advocates. Mm -hmm. It all comes from Hegel via Plekhanov, or Plekhanov, as you're meant to pronounce it, mm -hmm. who was a, a Soviet a Hegelian. I don't have anything to do with this. My view is, let's try to stop time happening. Mm -hmm. This is why we like the Tridentine Mass. Because I can be in Chicago in 2000 and, what is it, 18? Mm. <laughs> and I hear that divine mutter. I could be in Sicily in 200 AD and hear the same thing. Mm. Thus, time and space have been overcome. <laughs> and this is very far from the revolutionists' culture, which is all to do with corresponding and collaborating with time and with place. So I should hope that our revolution ain't a revolution. It's a risorgimento, mm. or an end of the revolution that made us somehow strange. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Peter, is your, is your music strange? Well done, you. <laughs> Is that a loaded question? I, 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 it's, it's, a, it's an interesting mm -hmm. idea, though, that, that, that a large chunk of the world might wrongly consider what you do rather strange. Well, let me use a different example. Um, I think that <clears throat> the strangest form of music that Catholics have is Gregorian chant. Mm. Um, and mm -hmm. I say that because <clears throat> in about eight different ways, chant is different from any form of music that we've been accustomed to for about 400 years. Um, for example, it's written in modes rather than keys. Um, it's written um, ametrically or without a definite meter. Um, it's unaccompanied by instruments in most cases. Um, it's sung in unison rather than in parts. Um, its authors are anonymous. I mean, I could go on. There's all these characteristics mm -hmm. that make it, that separate it from other forms of music. And I, I would suppose that to a person who lived a 1,000 years ago, chant wouldn't have seemed strange. 
because it was the pr primary mode of music that there was, and there really weren't any other competitors. But, uh, but now, fast forward to 2018, and we've, had, we've gone through Renaissance music and Baroque music and classical and romantic and modern, and you know, we, have all, we, we live in this gigantic um, sort of melting pot of musical styles. And then when we hear the chant come out in the church, it's like this, it's timeless and it's somewhat static, but it's also hauntingly beautiful. And it puts you right in the, in the mode of like, we are worshiping God right now. This is mm -hmm. what we're doing. This, this music is custom made for this function, for this purpose. Um, and so it's, it has the attractiveness, but also the strangeness of God in mm -hmm. it. Uh, and that, that I think is true about a lot of things that we do as Catholics, um, that is if we're traditionally inclined, we use a lot, we use gold chalices and brocade vestments and, um, and, we, and, and incense. We, we, we do things that don't have any other context anymore in the modern world except to be used for divine worship. And that's what gives them their, their extremely powerful resonance and symbolism, right? That they're, you know, they're consecrated for this purpose. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I'd like to add something to that. Of course. Um, I, I kind of take a different view than Sandy. I, I think we are not revolutionaries in the sense, but we are rationalists in the true sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And for example, playing off of what Peter was just talking about, we want to build churches that can have chant in them. Without, mag without amplification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a radical concept in modern yeah. architecture. Mm -hmm. Modern architecture, for the most part, the modernist movement has been about, well, you want it louder? We'll put in some amplifiers yeah. for you. <laughs> you know, oh, you want some echo? We got that. Mm. And, and so you really lose all of the richness of the building. Mm. And I think what we're about is putting the richness back in the building making a building that's good for chant, making a building that works for prayer, making a building that works for song, for the organ, all of those things. And you could say that it's radical. In a, it's only radical in a sense that it's a reaction to a radical point of view. Mm -hmm. and the radical point of view was technology can do anything. Yeah, but I think that's a false radicalism. I agree. And, and it is. Because it's dependent upon floral effects at the other end of the yeah. tree. Mm -hmm. And they come and go with the seasons. Yeah. The root is always there, mm -hmm. even in the depths of winter. Mm -hmm. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't go for, for revolutionism. Mm -hmm. Revolt is not what we're doing. It's resurgence. Yeah. Well, we are also, the other thing is, we are a grassroots movement. And I think that really is important because it really developed out of, I mean, everybody that I've worked with, all of the priests that I've worked with have had a very strong idea about what they wanted and didn't want. Some of that's Dennis's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, in, in all seriousness, Dennis has introduced a lot of priests to the idea. And I've worked with a lot of the priests that have been through Dennis's training, uh, have introduced priests to the idea that that it matters what they build. Yes, yes. Mm, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yes, I would like to know from, uh, I guess, briefly from each of you, there's been a moment that you've encountered something sacred, be it um, sculpture, painting, music, or architecture that has touched a wound, and you've exclaimed within yourself, my Lord and my God, has there been something particular then mm. that has influenced your work going mm -hmm. on? <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful question, and there are, there, are, there are actually with music, there have been so many occasions when I've been wounded by beauty um, in the way that Rotzinger talks about. Um, but I'll, I'll just mention two. One of them was hearing Monteverdi's Vespers of the Blessed Virgin for the first time. Um, that work, if you're familiar with it, you know what I why I'm saying that. If you're not, you should get to be familiar with it. But <laughs> it's, um, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a work of music that is like the heavens opening and, and the glory of God just shining forth in a way that's um, ineffable and, and breathtaking. 
Um, so that was, discovering that work was one sort of epiphany or theophany for me. Um, another one was singing the Missa Papi Marcelli by Palestrina, which I've had the chance to do twice, um, over, uh, separated by long intervals. But that, again, is a, is a mass that is so richly beautiful. I mean, I've, I wept both times I sang that mass as, as a part of a choir. Um, because it's, the beauty there is supernal. It's, it's on a different level than any merely earthly beauty. And you, you can tell that there are times when artists, even great artists, they reach beyond themselves to a new level. Um, to, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Juliet, I'm very curious if you can pick something, because this is actually a lot of what you talked about today. That kind of moment that you described, for example, when you went out to your car in the middle of a snowstorm and you had that almost suspended in time moment of seeing the snow going upwards and being struck yeah. by that. Yeah, it's interesting because I don't know if you asked the question because you really want to hear what we have to say because we all experience that. And the sublime experience is actually very difficult to put into words unless you're an artist yourself because what you experience, uh, when we experience it, we, we feel something. And when we're talking about it, it's almost news secondhand. <laughs> and so we almost cheapen our own experience mm -hmm. as we're mm -hmm. trying to say this. So um, John Ruskin, not to repeat the name too much, he wrote about this interesting idea of art versus news of the day. And he said news of the day is something that you read the newspaper and it's valuable, but the day after it's old and it's, you know, you, you wrap uh, uh, your plates in it before you ship it UPS or <laughs> it becomes useless the day after. But something that's extraordinarily well done, there's an element of taste and there's an element of timing, but uh, a great artist of all stripes, they have the ability to put the very best of themselves into what it is they're creating. And what he said was kind of interesting because you think, wow, I really love this poem. I imagine if I met the poet, uh, how much more there would be to experience. And the irony is, often when you meet the person, there's how much less you experience. Mm -hmm, yeah. Because they put the very best of themselves. Mm -hmm. How many of us have the community around us to be able to support our deepest thoughts? So for people over hundreds of years, they saved that secret self for art. And to the degree that they were brilliant, is a degree that there's a resonance. It's almost the greatest form of time travel ever created. Nothing we have technologically has ever matched it. So that would be my, mm. I've experienced it lots of times. I'm so lucky. Mm. Yeah. Sandy, do you For me, it's through music, mm. first and last. You know, we've all heard of the chill factor in mm. music, where we hear something and we get a bristle up the back of our necks. For me, it's in Meister Singers by Wagner. We've got the great stolid C major overture. Relentless C major signifying the conservatism of the Meister Singers of Nuremberg. We know that Walter von Stolzing is going to come along and shake this up to a little extent, but still honor the German masters. Well, the music goes on in the prelude. Blasting of dum tum ta ta, you know the tune, da dum 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 dum, and it goes on and on with the most astonishing fugal developments, and then suddenly the curtain comes up, and we're in the Church of Nuremberg, and the choir takes over, the orchestra dies, and it's now a choral chorale. For me, even talking about it now, I've got the bristles going up the back of my neck. Mm -hmm. What are these hackles, these bristles? Here's a thing. <laughs> Here's a city block in Chicago, OK? And along here, along the sidewalk, is coming a dog, right? And along here is coming a cat, <laughs> right? And at the corner, they meet each other. And what do they do? They bristle up to make themselves bigger, so that when they meet, one sees a bigger creature than the other. Mm. Now, man is a creature, and the rising of the hair follicles on the back of the neck are to do with a residual experience of how to deal with fear. You talk about the aesthetic wounding. High aesthetics like this cause a man or woman to be afraid of something. And this is what gives us this delicious experience of our hackles rising when we encounter something particularly beautiful and powerful. 
It is the will within us dying at that experience. Therefore, it seeks to bring us to life, to make us bigger, so that we can counteract this artistic experience. Hmm. Are you saying that you see something in an experience like that that is, uh, so it's a, a terrifying It's grip. terror. Mm -hmm. Because it's, as Schopenhauer proved, or didn't prove, he can prove nothing in this line, but <laughs> as he postulated, <laughs> aesthetic experience stills the will to live. So that when we have a very strong aesthetic experience, we feel ourselves beginning to die. Mm. So therefore, we bristle ourselves yeah. up yeah. to defend ourselves yes. against this art. Mm -hmm. And this is always why beautiful art is on the back foot, mm. because it is a threat to humanity. Yeah. Yep. This is the, the, the tremendous paradox. And this mm. is why I believe that the cave painters of, you know, of great prehistory, that's why they painted in caves. They scuttled their way down into the depths of the earth so that nobody should catch them <laughs> doing this thing that would freak everybody else out. <laughs> mm. and, the, and, and along that line, although you were speaking about music, and this is maybe a little bit more along what Juliet was saying, um, the Israelites were afraid of God, right? Yeah. Yeah. Moses, right? Yeah. And then when he sees God and his, his face is transformed and he comes down from the mountain, they have to put a, a veil over yes. him because they can't even look at him. He's quite because he's seen the numinous yeah. and is bringing it back. And I think in great art, particularly for a Christian, if it's, if it's great sacred art, but great art in general, you know, Las Meninas or something like mm -hmm. that, when you see it for the first time, it is the hair on your back of your neck. Mm -hmm. It's joy and sorrow combined. Indeed. And it's the sense of wanting to stay in that moment forever and being so upset that you know you can't. Exactly. And right? it's also the fact that at that moment we realize we're great, we're so capable of so much more. Like mm. you, you realize how life ought to be and yeah. what we could be and that we're not. Yes. And so for a moment it's there. Yeah. Yep. You, it's a grieving for the minuscule ration that you get mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. where you could have had a feast. Yes. Absolutely. It's a grieving experience. Absolutely. A modern age brought up on the, on the icy teat of Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> you can quote me on that if you want. <laughs> I have to say, a modern age suckled on the icy teat of Nietzsche. That's, that's very groundskeeper. I can't really. remember what I was going to say Actually. there. <laughs> Sorry. No, but it's the fine. modern age, this feeling of, of grief, yeah. compassion, Sadness. None of these things we want to match up to. Yeah. Or, or confess. Yeah. You, you get to pick a building if you want. A building? Or oh, a you know, wow. bridge or whatever. I would say um, one night just going into Notre Dame Cathedral on a whim, walking in and walking into evening prayer without realizing it was happening, all in French, uh, but sung. Mm. And um, standing at one end and looking down the enormous expanse of that cathedral. And they have a very elaborate sort of French Renaissance high altar, which is nothing in the daytime, but they had it lit beautifully at night. And seeing the singer in a white dress, you know, really beautifully lit, and then seeing the altar behind was an overwhelming experience. It's mm. just absolutely spectacular yeah. and heckles with the net back of the neck. Definitely. Yeah, and taking you out of time. Oh, completely. Well. Yeah. I've never Something forgotten all of you have I mean, referred it was, to today. It was just a very brief. Uh, we yeah. stayed for the rest of evening prayer, of course. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Paul, that Paul Claudel had that famous experience in mm -hmm. the same cathedral. Oh. Mm -hmm. His, the, the experience of midnight mass that converted him to the faith. Mm -hmm. Just walking in, listening to evening prayer. The other one that is um, the uh, St. Francis of Assisi, the going down to the... Uh, to the shrine it was an extremely incredible experience. And Ralph Adams Cram talked about it as a conversion experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the first time I went, it was like that. Of course, they've, they've renovated it and made it much brighter now, so it's kind of lost that. that but mystery. the first time yeah. that I went down, it was that way. It was dark, it was all lit with candles. It was, you know, you just really felt you were in the presence mm. right there. 
Mm -hmm. That was a great experience. The final question for the evening. Thank you. So I um, teach drawing and painting at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. And in that, um, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I would say that the uh, general idea about beauty, the most kind of commonly held consensus is that it's uh, subjective, uh, purely on the level experiential. Now we've had um, many talks um, through the Catholic Art Guild about beauty in the arts. Um, but my question is um, understanding the um, difference in painting, especially in the plastic arts compared to music and architecture. Um, Juliet, primarily this is for you. Um, you had started out your conversation uh, with your father, this debate about an objective beauty versus purely experiential. And then you spoke to us on a very personal level, again about, I felt, the experiential. So my question is, what uh, criterion we can hold in common as um, painters and visual artists for the beautiful? Um, again, I experienced the very subjective side of it. And then um, I have a degree of pessimism about a lot of um, the arts movements that are looking back, where I feel the goal is to imitate rather than to absorb and kind of surpass. And I, I really am craving a criterion for, for painting. So you, you're looking for a universal principle that you can apply to beauty that doesn't involve looking back to a specific art form? I mean, or a specific time period or specific Specific not or? just limited to a particular epoch. Um, so, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because you see in art schools and you find it if you ever talk to people about beauty, a lot of discussion that actually uh, we tend to give it more validity than it actually deserves because most people, if you, if you tie to other things, for example, um, if you'd give somebody a choice between a nice picnic in a parking lot of a Target center or a four-star magnificent uh, dinner at, I think we ate at the Rosebud yesterday, which was outstanding, mm -hmm. uh, nobody would choose parking lot. Nobody. It doesn't matter what their view of aesthetics is. So people put up a great fight that isn't actually matched by their behavior. And you can always tell what somebody truly be believes by the choices that they make. As far as uh, going for principles rather than any sort of uh, principles as, as a, um, uh, rather than um, subject matter, which is kind of weighing sub what, what you're weighing. For um, music, there's vibrations and sound and painting, there's vibrations and light. Uh, but in, in all art forms, there's harmony and rhythms and design as a human intention that distinguishes art from accident. And often, when you begin to start this, uh, looking at ratios and looking at nature and seeing how it plays out in art, you can start to get towards uh, the bare bones of things. And so uh, there's a lot when you, when you talk about Vitruvius, who designed buildings in the shape uh, with the divisions and proportions of a human being, mm. the same way you'd see growth patterns in a plant as it expands outward towards the light. Well, you go and look at the work by Piero della Francesca, and the geometry he used with his compass and his ruler matched in some way, although not the um, outward form of a building, the, the construction of a canvas. So I don't think because you use traditional uh, medium or you use representational painting, you are tied to any particular uh, uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. And I'd just be bold and stand right where you are, and it will come around, I think. Thank you to our speakers. What a wonderful panel discussion. Great conversation.